Good morning, Crossbridge. We're so glad you came to spend this morning with us. Um, if you're a first time guest, extra special welcome to you. Um, we're so glad you came to, to see us this morning. My name is Julie. I serve on staff as the women's director. Crossbridge exists to make growing followers of Jesus Christ that know God, grow intentionally, and make a difference. We would love to help you make your next step in whatever area that might be. Um, one of the ways you can do that is by filling out the, the, new, the, the Connect card. There's one in the seat back pocket around you. Or you can actually scan in just a second right up there um, a QR code and fill it out right on your phone. Um, so fill that out. Um, later in the service, we will worship through giving, so you can drop those cards in there at that time if you would like to. Uh, we have some fun stuff coming up. The Fall Fest is, it's officially fall. It doesn't feel like it, but that's what they tell us. It's supposed to be fall now, so I'm going to pretend. But the Fall Fest, hopefully by October 27th, we'll be feeling those cooler temperatures. But mark your calendars. Um, it's going to be a great morning here at Crossbridge. There's a lot of fun surprises we have planned. Um, so it's a great time for you to make sure that you guys come and enjoy it. But also invite your friends and neighbors. It's, it's, a, it's a fun morning to come and, and experience Crossbridge, especially if it's the first time. We also have that same day, later that night, um, a parenting conference. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm a parent, and, and it's, it's kind of rough out there, guys. And so what we want to do is just come alongside you and help you have more tools to navigate biblically, biblically um, all that our kids are experiencing in the world, issues of sexuality, gender, all that kind of stuff. We're going to get together as a church family and, um, and work on that together that night. Um, Andrea Crum will be our speaker. She's with Genuine Family Ministries, and so you don't want to miss that. Sign up. Dinner's included. You can go onto the website right now and get signed up. Um, and lastly, gentlemen, today is the last day to get your early deadline price. Who doesn't like sp saving money? Nobody. Everybody wants to save money. So sign up today. Don't procrastinate. Today is the day. Mark your calendar. You're going to want to be there. Today we're going to continue our series on the table, um, but before Chuck comes to, to share with us, um, we're going to do, uh, stand with me please for the reading of God's word. Our passage today is 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This is God's word. Well, if you read world history and or watch the news, you find that there is constant conflict over contested spaces, whether it's land in the Middle East, Eastern Europe, or a lawsuit in some part of the country, and who owns what, and who belongs to what, and where's the lines, and all kinds of things. Contested spaces start wars, start lawsuits, and it's a constant fight and battle. But today, I want to make the argument that the human body is the most contested space in the world. Your body and my body, the most contested space in the world. I mean, whose body is it? It's our body, right? We have the right to do with whatever we want to. We can wear what we want and eat what we want, drink what we want, consume what we want, do whatever we want, when we want, however we want, as long as we don't hurt anybody. I mean, the story that we are bombarded with 24-7 through all sorts of media, whether it's social, digital news cycle, billboards, uh, entertaining programs, music, whatever, is that it's my body, my choice. And if I don't like my body, I, well, I can change it. And some of that's healthy. You know, we want to get healthy, want to lose weight. But if I don't like that I'm getting older, well, I can have some injections to help with that. If all of a sudden I, I have a sexual encounter I, you know, didn't plan on getting pregnant in, well, I, I can get rid of that baby, right, because it's my body, my choice. If I don't like my gender, I can change that. 
If we don't even like things or how things are going and the way our health is going, we can even make the choice to end our life because it's my body, my choice, right? I mean, that's the story that we're all bombarded with 24-7. It's a story I would bet in a room this size that some of you are like, yeah, that's right. What are you about to say, pal? Well, what I'm about to say is, what if it's not true? What if there's another story? What if there's a better story? What if there was a story that valued, esteemed, and brought great hope for you and your body than the story we hear 24-7? What if there was an alternative story that said all the thoughts you have about the body that our culture bombards us with actually isn't raising the value of the body at all. It's actually lowering the value. And that there's another story that raises it up to a place really probably beyond most of our imagination. As Julie said, we're continuing our series on the table. We're talking about questions confronting the Christ Christian faith. And we've talked about politics uh, last week. Uh, we, we talked about technology. And today we talk about faith and our bodies. And to do that, um, we're going to do some heavy lifting today. Because since we're bombarded 24-7 with a story, how in the world could I hope that in 35 or 40 so minutes that I can change the narrative in your head. Well, I can't, but hopefully the Holy Spirit can help us through the scripture. But what I'm going to do is give it my best college try. I'm going to be like the old batter Babe Ruth, and I'm going to point to the fence. Because I'm hoping not that the sermon's great, but then when we're done, you're like, there is an alternative story. And the choice before you will be, which story will you believe? Which story will you live out? Because the story of Scripture tells a different story of the human body. A lot of times in spirituality and Christian Christianity, what happens is we've had a form of an old, um, uh, old heresy seep in called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism tries to separate the body and the spirit. The, the body, that's bad, it's icky, it's awful. You know, the spirit, the soul is what matters and all that. And, you know, can't you wait till we die? We get rid of this old junk suit and then we get to be in heaven forever and all that kind of stuff. That's just not the story the scripture tells. That's the story our culture tells, you, you know, um, the movie Soul. You're going to float around this blob forever. And countless movies before that. You're going to be on a cloud and you leave your body and all this stuff. But what does really the scripture say about our body? Well, we're going to have several movements as we walk through this story. The first is that God designed us as embodied people. God designed us, humanity, as embodied people, meaning we have bodies. The only life we live is actually in our body. I've yet to do something outside my body. Did you go on a trip? Yes. How was it? Well, I don't know. I stayed there, but I was there, not in my body. You would go, stop taking that stuff. <laughs> You're going to hurt yourself. But this is how we were made. This is how we were designed. Look at Genesis 1, 26 and 27 with me. Then God said, let us make man. Really, that word could be translated humanity. It's the, it's the, Greek, it's the Hebrew word Adam, which we're, of course we get Adam eventually from. But let us make humanity in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So in the ancient world, it was thought the only people in the image of God were the rulers, the emperors, and the pharaohs. So to have an ancient document that says, no, it's everyone that's made 
in the image of God. That's his representatives. That reflects his glory and his beauty and his standard. Is a startling claim for the ancient world Genesis was written in and to our world today. Now, Genesis 2 kind of expounds on the story of creation. Genesis 2, 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Now, some of you have read bugged before probably by the fact that you've read Genesis, and it seems like chapter 1 and chapter 2 tell two different creation accounts. Well, what it is, because it, it, it is. But chapter 1, it's not two different stories, it's two different reflections on it. Chapter 1 is more like a poem and has rhythm and rhyme to it, showing the beauty of creation. Chapter 2 is more the prose and the narrative and the drama of it. It's how a Hebrew would have communicated. But the point is, in both chapters, is all things created, out of all things created, only men and women were made in the image of God. Everything was spoken into existence except for people. He formed man out of the dust of the earth. The writer is talking about more careful craftsmanship there. And God breathes his life into the man. He didn't do that to the animals. The writer is saying something's different about these creations. There's something different, higher, holier, more glorious about humanity. Humans, Adam's given a job, and his first job is to name the animals. And one of the things about naming the animals, the point is not to name the animals. The point was not to be able to call a rhino a rhino. The point was for Adam to see everybody has a partner but me. Everything has a partner, day and night, land and sea but it's just him. And so the narrative continues in Genesis 2.18 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Now, ladies, the word helper sometimes bothers ladies that come up and that talk to me about that for years. And, and helper, the Hebrew word is ezer. It, it often references God. It means one to come alongside And so it's not helper like you're an assistant or you're a maid. So you can, it's okay to remind your husband of that. He can pick up after himself, okay? He can, he can make dinner, all right? Uh, you, you come alongside. You're, you're not his servant. The word, though, to focus on in the verse is the word fit. It means suitable. It could be translated a like opposite. That this is an ezer that's a like op- opposite, similar and different, like Adam, but different. And then when Adam sees Eve for the first time, what does he say? Genesis 2, 23. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Notice that all that terminology is bodily terminology. You will find as you read the scripture, the scripture has a high value of the body. It's not saying, oh, the spirit's more important than the body. It doesn't know that dichotomy. That the mind, the soul, and the body, that's a human being. And so it's because that, that there is this helper, this Ezra, this old come alongside, like but different companion. The scripture tells us this, Genesis 2.24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, his like opposite, his one that comes alongside, and they shall become one flesh. God is setting up the created order of how things should be sexually, physically. He's setting that up. And it's all that happens in our bodies. Alike, but different parts unified. The life that we were created in the beginning and even now is a life that happens in a body. We're embodied people made in His image designed a certain way to come together and be united in only certain ways. Now, this creation doesn't last long because now, we've, you know, then, and we don't have time to read every verse in the book of Genesis, but it says that Adam and Eve were in the garden. They were naked and unashamed. And so it just, it's paradise. They're in a garden. They can eat of everything but one tree. 
the animals they've named. There's all kinds of speculation. Like, do the animals talk? Is this like a, what is, and what is Eden? Like, what is it and where is it? And there's some thoughts from Hebrew scholars that, 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 that it's where earth and heaven had collided and it's this in-between place that we can't get to anymore. It's the dwelling place of God, this created, this creation place. And so it's just, it's, it's made people forever just speculate, what is Eden, where is it, and all that. All we know is it's a place without sin. A place that was here without sin. Where God dwelt with humanity and humanity dwelt together in harmony in their bodies with him. But now we find that we are living an embodied curse. We're living an embodied curse. Adam and Eve are deceived, of course, by the serpent. And their choice to reject God fractures the universe. And notice that in the story, it is a creation that comes to Eve. The, the serpent, the enemy, the devil is not a creator. He can't create anything. He's a creation. All he can do is twist creation, twist the words of the creator, distorts God's truth and creation. He has no clay to make things with. So what he tries to do is twist the creator's clay. And now we live in a world where things are out of tune. And do you notice, if you've ever read the Genesis narrative before, maybe you haven't, and that's great. Maybe you've seen it for the first time today. The first thing when they sin, the first thing they notice is, their bodies. Genesis 3, 7 says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Before they had been naked and unashamed. But now they're aware of their nakedness, and they feel shame, and they make coverings for themselves, and they hide, and they blame and then when God walks in the garden, one of the first things he says to Adam after he says, where are you? The first thing, one of the first things God says to him is says, who told you you were naked? What, what is going, how do you, are you aware of that? Did you eat of the fruit I told you not to eat? And this now has this story, this sin, this rebellion, this cosmic adultery and treason, it's the world we now live in. It's a world where now there is isolation from God. God called humanity not being together, man and wife not being together. He called that not good. And guess what we're in right now? Not good. Because we are isolated from each other. And I, I, I would speculate, since this moment now, the human body is the most contested place because men and women were supposed to reflect the divine nature. We're supposed to reflect the image of God to creation, and we still can somewhat, but not like we could in Eden. And so maybe there's more going on around us than we think. Perhaps the true story of the universe isn't, hey, it's your body, your choice, but it's, hey, there's an evil being who's trying to distort and destroy the masterpieces of God, and he's lying to us all the time. And disconnection from God, which of course is the main thing sin brought into the world, leads disconnection from each other and even from our own bodies. Our bodies don't work the way they should anymore. You know this. Anyone that's over 30 knows this. All of a sudden you woke up, you're like, why am I in pain? The phrase sleep-related injury. You didn't know that when you are in your 20s and your teens. But something happened and all of a sudden, and at 40, this model starts breaking down. And you're just like, what is happening? Well, we're in an embodied curse. The, the ground is cursed. We, death has now entered the world. Things are fractured. Our, our distance from our creator is not bringing us life like we thought it would. It brings death. Rich Velotis has this quote. It's kind of long, but I, I think it's a pretty good quote. More than just feeling guilt or existential dread, Adam and Eve find themselves in shameful estrangement with their bodies because of a strange relationship with God. From this point on, the human experience is marked more by using than communion, more by a destructive separation of body and soul than by a body-soul unity, more by a paralyzing preoccupation with our bodies rather than a holy unawareness. To sum it up, our bodies are perverted by a powerful root of shame. Now, I made a mistake. The 
scriptures tell us in the Psalms that we're still fearfully and wonderfully made. We are knitted together in our mother's womb that every life matters to God. But the earth is cursed now and things don't work right. One day we can't see things far away. One day the words in front of us are fuzzy. Some of us all of a sudden can't hear as well as we used to. We feel aches and pains in our hands and our legs, and sometimes our brains don't even work right. And, and that, that could be we fade from age or something begins to happen to us. Some of us, we're not born and, uh, right. Something happened with our bodies when we're born, and, and things aren't like we know they should be. And, of course, we die. And all this is about the curse that's on our bodies. But... Jesus came not only to save our soul and renew our minds, but to transform our bodies. Now, you guys okay? Everybody all right? We need a little, just want to pause here because I know I haven't had a lot of funny stories. You know, I mean, the sleep-related injury was nice. Yeah, I wasn't in the notes. I was trying that out. That worked well. Um, (laughs) You know, so just making sure we're all okay because it's a little heavy. And, um, you know, I saw a squirrel running on Highway 59 today. Never seen that before. You know, that's kind of interesting. So, all right. Everybody okay? All right. We'll keep going. So what did Jesus come for? Jesus came for embodied redemption. Embodied redemption. See, the redemption story doesn't start in the manger. It actually starts when God is telling Adam and Eve all the repercussions for their sin. But in the midst of the repercussions, he talks about the offspring of the woman crushing the head of the serpent and his heel being bruised. A couple of things about that. One, Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise. And two, notice the physicality of the promise, the crushing of the head and a heel. So what is God, how does the whole redemption arc start? Well, you could talk about knowing the ark, you could talk about all those things, but really the covenant, really the covenant that's going to lead to the coming of Jesus starts with a man named Abram and a woman named Sarai, and eventually there'll be Abraham and Sarah. And what's the deal with them? They're really old and they don't have children. And part of the curse, a lot of times we think, well, the curse of a woman in childbirth, but that word childbirth, could, that, that we translate that, that, could also have to do with infertility. And Sarah felt great shame because she's infertile. But God says, I'm about to start something with you guys that's going to end up blessing the world. And it's going to come from your bodies. The sign of the covenant people has to do with their bodies. All spirituality happens in the body, friends. Throughout the whole story of the Old Testament, and then Jesus comes in a body. The birth, he's born of a real woman. Now, it's a different kind of birth because there is no man involved. The Holy Spirit implants this life within her. And God becomes a person. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh, became a human, and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glories of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was a human being. He took on a human body. There's an old, there's an old uh, heresy that says, well, it's not like our body. He just appeared human. He was probably glowing all the time. And his feet, there's actually people that believe this, that taught this in the ancient world. His feet probably never touched the ground because that would soil him. That's just all heresy and lies. And he was a human being. It says he slept. It says he got hungry. Most likely Jesus burped. Most likely Jesus went to the bathroom. Because he was human, that's what we do. He didn't have like some su- you know, supernatural you know, way of digesting food. Don't you need to go? No, I'm Jesus. I'm fine. <laughs> what? No, he was a human being. So he's such, and, 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 and in the midst of the biblical story, see, sometimes the Bible is subversive. People say, well, where's the verse about this? And where's the verse about that? If you read the story, God says, you'll just listen to my story, the story I'm telling. And stop looking for your little nuggets to hold on to. You'll see what you're looking for. Mary, when she's pregnant with Jesus, goes to see her cousin Elizabeth, another infertile woman, who God came to and said, I'm going to give you a baby. 
And that baby's going to prepare the way. And when Mary walks in, the baby in Elizabeth's womb, who according to our culture is not a person. And pretty much the, the standard, standard thought now is, well, it's a human, but it's not a person. Well, when does, when does this thing become a person? Well, that's quite unknown. Well, according to the biblical story, the, the baby heard Mary's voice and leapt in his mother's womb. At the response of the, the, the voice of Mary and the presence of the Savior, who was in the room in his mother's tummy. Everybody matters. Bodies. It, 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 we live in embodied faith. Jesus came from embodied redemption. And so what does Jesus begin to do? He begins to teach. And, he, and after 30 years of working in a body as a carpenter with his parents, spending time with the Father, he then begins to teach. He begins to heal bodies. Blind eyes, deaf ears, lame eggs. He touches dead bodies and they come back. He calls them out of tombs. There were skin diseases. And the thought is, if you touch them, you will become unclean and contaminated. But Jesus is like, no. See, when I touch them, they get my clean cleanliness. They don't, and my, my redemption, I don't get their disease. He heals bodies. He's tempted in every way we're tempted. That means he was tempted to do things with his body that we are tempted to do. But he was without sin. Over and over we can see through the actions and the teachings of Jesus that he affirms the body, the way it was created, the way it was designed. And then Jesus, with his body, offers himself in our place for our sins. Physical things happen to his body. And somehow in God's design, God's order, what happens to his body as it's being thrashed and tortured and nailed and it's hanging and it's suffocating, the father is putting the sins of the world upon him and he is serving as a substitute in his body for the sins of the world. Since ultimate outcome is the death of the body and Jesus took that on. He really died. He was really buried. I remember years ago when the old film, The Passion of the Christ, came on, the uh, worship pastor at the time that started the church with me, his name's Tim, and he's a pastor up in Conroe now, and we went and saw it together, and, and you know, we had the seat, you know, separation that men do in theaters, you know, and um, so it's, it's like, oh, there's only about eight people in the theater because we went in the middle of the day, and just watching the brutal torture of a man's body. And realizing, you know, I, I know this is an adaptation. I know this is special effects in Hollywood. But sometimes we just, we don't think about what he went through in his body. And in his body, he bore our sin and shame. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Think about when we take communion. We say that the, the bread, the cracker, represents the body of Christ. That the juice represents the blood of Christ. Physical things. And then we ingest it physically. It's a physical act connected to a spiritual reality. Because the Bible knows of nothing else for us. Every act of worship we do, we do in our bodies. And yes, there's, there's the heart. And yes, there's our thoughts. But those are connected to us. Every sin I've committed, I've committed in my body, whether I thought it or did it. And Jesus came to bring embodied redemption. And then Jesus rose in embodied victory. Friday gives way to Sunday. They went to put spices on the body and there was no body. And here is the way they thought about things. when They didn't go around going, hey, we don't know where the body is. We know Jesus is up in heaven. Mary's language was, where are they taking him? Because it was so intertwined with them. And then he began to appear. And he appears to Mary. And Mary hangs on to him and says, you, you can't hang on to me. I got things I got to do. And I'm going to be ascending to my father soon. And go tell the others. He invites Thomas to see and touch the wounds. Put your hands here, Thomas. Put your hand in my side. 
touch my actual body. He eats fish on the beach with him. He appears to over 500 people at one time. Acts 1.3 says he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God for 40 days. The physically resurrected Jesus is with them. Now, is his body different? It seems to be different. The people don't recognize him sometimes at first. The people walking to him with Emmaus, either Jesus kept him, them from noticing, but, but also when he's on the beach calling out, maybe he's too far that Peter and them could, you know, say like, is that Jesus or not until they realize later after they catch a fish that he's the Lord. He's a body where he can walk through walls. And so is that because he's got his full, you know, God power status or is it his new body? The text doesn't say, and we could really just speculate, but there is something glorified and different about his body. Probably much like when he was on the mountain with Peter, James, and John, the scripture tells us, and he was transfigured. His body began to glow and he began to be bright and, and Moses and Elijah appeared. Something happened to Jesus's body on the mountain. And so he rose from the dead in a body. He paid for our sins in a body. And do you realize when he ascended to heaven, he had a body and he still has a body today. And the resurrection is not just some, you know, kind of just kind of spiritual idea or, or it is a physical reality. In fact, the scripture banks on it where the apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Because if Christ isn't raised, it was just another nice guy dying. Not a sinless man as a substitute in our place, raised by the power of God. Jesus was born in a body, lived in a body, died in a body, rose in a body, reigns right now in a body, and will return in a body. Do you see in my very feeble attempts, the story of Scripture has bodies, it's, the body is, is central to our faith. And then next, we are redeemed and struggle in embodied spirituality. When we've put our faith in Christ, we trust him as our savior. We surrender our lives to him. His Holy Spirit comes to live within our bodies. Now, do we have the full measure of redemption yet? No, because we're still getting sick. We're still dying. We're still struggling with our bodies. But his spirit now lives within us. We have already experienced salvation, but not yet the consummation of that, which will happen at his return. More on that in a second. Our, our body now is his temple. And that leads us back to the verse that Julie read. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually moral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know? And I would think if any verse for our culture today, any question, this is a great one. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. And listen to the next sentence and think about how anti-American this is. You are not your own. For you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. Sin, Jesus tells us, starts in the heart. That theft and murder and adultery and all the like starts in the heart. Starts with disordered desires. But many times they work its way out in our actual bodies. They work its way out there. And so what happened to us into our salvation is now we live in a world where we're not our own. Whose body is it? Is it my body, my choice, or his body, his way? Because if I'm a follower of Jesus, I've chose, to live in under a different, I've chose to live under a different story. A story says that your body is valuable because it's made in the image of God. A story that doesn't blink in the face of anything painful because it says, yeah, 
you live in embodied curse. A story that has great hope for the body and sympathizes with the body because Jesus lived embodied. And his body was raised. So whose body is it? It's God's body. Not to exploit or, or just to use for, his, use for whims like Greek mythology gods do, but to redeem. So we're to glorify God in our body. This doesn't just translate to sexuality like in this passage, but translate to our speech. It translates to what we eat. Like now you're meddling. I know. I look in the mirror. I get on the scale like, okay. Cons what we consume, how we work, how we rest, how we treat other people's bodies, all of it. That it, our spirituality happens in our bodies, through our bodies, to other bodies. And we still struggle in our bodies. Our bodies still aren't right. We live in a time where people say, I, I just, I don't, I don't feel right. We live at a time where people say, and, and I know there's some of you who are like, when are you going to get to just smash in the opposition? When are you going to get to smash in the, the transgender and the gender dysphoria and all that? I don't think I follow a savior who ever smashes. Anyone except religious people. Now, no, we don't repent and turn to Christ as king. All will stand before his judgment. And there's still a calling out of grace and truth. But I think if anyone in the world can sympathize with people, and sympathizing does not mean accept. Sympathizing means I understand your struggle. If there's anyone in the world that can understand the struggle of something's not right with my body, it should be us. Because Paul himself said this, for I do not do the good I want. But the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. You should read the whole passage. Up earlier in verse 15, he says, I don't understand my own actions. Because we struggle. Our hearts will know we're part of another kingdom. And sometimes our bodies say, yeah, but what about us? And we have this war within us. These desires that war and plague and say, my way. And this other part of our deep desire says, no, his way. Because we're not home yet. See, the way of Jesus, friends, is, is about our beliefs. Absolutely. We believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and of Jesus Christ, his son, and the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. We affirm that the scripture is the breathed out inspired word of God, our authority for all faith and action. But the way of Jesus is also an embodied spirituality. And so right now we, 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 have, we are saved in our bodies, we're struggling in our bodies, we're being sanctified in our bodies, made holy in our bodies. And according to the story, I am not my own. What right does a Christian say that someone can't do something with their body? Well, I, I, I don't have any right in of myself. But I will say, according to the biblical story, you're a created being. And that creator does have rights, which we're all rebelling against. We're born with our backs toward him. And if you're redeemed, you know Jesus well, then your body was bought back from sin and you are not your own. You ever think about that when you watch certain things? You ever think about that when you drink certain things or you get so anxious you go to get another cookie? You watch another show? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So we are redeemed and we struggle in embodied spirituality. You okay? I got two more points and we're done. <laughs> this is the good part. The other parts I think are really good too, but this is a really great part. We will live with God forever in resurrected bodies. The story isn't that we will unzip this suit 
and float around on clouds as disembodied souls forever. No, the story is because Jesus was resurrected, he's the first fruit of the coming resurrection for all humanity, for all that put their faith and trust in him, who will live forever, live forever with God in a garden city. And there, there seems to be something about jobs, there seems to be something about purpose, there seems to be, you know, a lot of it's mystery, but some of it's very clear. But what's very clear, 1 Corinthians 15, 49 says, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, that would be Adam, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. We'll live for God forever in a resurrected world without sin. That Jesus didn't just come to save souls. He came to save everything. He came to save us. He came to save the universe. He came to save the world. He's going to make all things new. It's not just he's going to look at creation and go, ah. He's going to look at creation and he's just going to heal it. And all sin will be gone. And he will renew it. And there's still going to be differences because it says every tribe and tongue will be there. So something about race, something about gender, something about ethnicity. There's a mystery into how it's all going to be We're there. But somehow that's all still going to be there. So we're not all turning white. We're not all turning I Israeli. We're, not, we're, we're still us. But we're a resurrected us without sin, together with him forever in a world that every fairy tale tries to point to of happily ever after, but they, they just can't grasp it. It's, it's a tune you're humming, you've known, you've heard before, but you cannot place the song. An embodied, resurrected body. Resurrected bodies. So what's the bottom line about faith in our bodies? I don't have time to get to all the issues today. I've tried to point several times to talk about abortion, our gender, and, and all of these things. But the bottom line today is this. The Christian faith is an embodied faith. Why does God care about sex and gender and what we do with our bodies, what we eat, what we drink? There's a verse that says, so what if you eat, drink, or whatever you do? Do all for the glory of God. Why does he care? Because he cares about you, he cares about me, he cares about his creation. And so if the Christian faith's an embodied faith, where does this leave us? Well, it leaves us offering a different story to the world. Not The story is not, you're gross. The story is, there's a creator. And the Christian story, friends, the Christian story, no other story, I believe values the body, your body, more than the story of God and the story of Jesus. It comes to us to heal our bodies. Because it's in our bodies we act out our sins, but it's also in our bodies we practice our faith. You came here in a body today. You're listening in your body. You're sitting in your body. We'll stand up and sing with our body. It's all happening. This alternative story of, of grace and truth. There's harm that's been done to our bodies by others. There's the effect of the curse on our bodies from physical challenges to feeling like we don't understand ourselves to not liking ourselves. And in the midst of those challenges and wounds that we've all faced... This story doesn't say, well, cut yourself, you'll feel better, change yourself and be, and be free. It says, come to Jesus. And he offers grace and truth and healing for you, every part of you. It's why every life from the unborn baby to the elderly person matters to God. It is the story of divine fingerprints and design on every human being you've ever seen. Even ones that you feel like you were born and you weren't born like everybody else. You weren't born right. His fingerprints are still there and his redemptive hand longs to come and touch and bring healing and change. To call you to turn from things maybe you've turned toward you shouldn't. That's called repentance. And to bring healing and salvation to you. It's a story of hope that says death is not our friend and death is not the final word. It's, we offer an alternative story to the world. 
But you got to live in that story, friend, if you're a Christian. How do we live in the story? One last verse. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. You know, you, you probably know Romans. It, it, it tells all this stuff about the mercy and grace of God for 11 chapters before it. So in view of all that, what should we do with the grace of God who pays for our sins? While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Present your bodies, your bodies, your fingers, your toes, your eyes, your nose, your privates, your belly, your legs. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, offering yourself holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. This is your spiritual worship. Singing, sure, we call it worship. But what's your spiritual worship? Your body, my body, in response to the mercy of God, saying, it's now your body. I am no longer my own. I want to glorify you in and with my body. And part of that means then, I surrender my body to him. I offer it to him. Every day, throughout the day, I offer. when I've offered it to something else, when I've offered it to the extra cookie I didn't need, when I offered it to the lustful look on the screens I shouldn't have looked at, when I've offered it to someone I shouldn't have offered it to, when I've offered anger when I shouldn't have offered it and it came through my body, when I offered words I shouldn't have offered, what do I do? I repent. I come back and say, I offered it to something else. And I come back to you now and I ask you to cleanse me. And once again, I remember what you did with your body. The view of God's mercy is what you did with your body, Jesus. Because of what you did with your body, I offer my body to you. And notice that right after that, do not be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to their story. Don't let the socials and the news and the entertainment and the really catchy songs about being born this way. Don't conform yourself to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Get in the better story. Get in the story of Scripture. So by testing, you may be able to discern what is the will of God. You'll be able to see what God really wants for you and your body. And what God wants is good, acceptable, and perfect. Don't let the culture conform you to its story. Glorify God in your body. Friends, the body is beautiful, complex, broken, redeemable a temple for God's presence. And one day, we'll be resurrected without sin. No other story values and esteems and promises restoration and hope for the body like the Christian story. What story are you living in? And is it really a good one? This story, this reality, Jesus says, come to me. Come to me, and I'll give you life. Life abundant forever. Will you pray with me? Now, if you find yourself here today and you are extremely offended by all that I've said and you're like, no, it is my body and my choice, then perhaps what I would challenge you with is what if you stopped right down and just prayed a simple prayer? Jesus, if your story is true, Will you reveal yourself to me? And if you're an honest seeker, 
You're not just saying that to go through it. You begin to pray that on a regular basis. I believe he will answer that prayer. If you're, a follower, if you're not a follower of Jesus, stay and you're like, I, I, my body feels jacked. I've done some things with it. I, some things have been done to it. Then what if you just came to Jesus today, friend? What if you brought him your past, your present, your future, your mind, your soul, your body, and you said, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I, I, I give myself to you. Will you forgive me of my sin? Will you cleanse me? Will you become my king and my Lord? I, I want to be bought from sin and shame and death. You could do that right now. Whatever you've done in your body, however you've used it for yourself or things that you would never mention in public, whatever you feel shame in, in your body right now. You can bring that to Jesus. And not only will he forgive you and save you, he will begin to heal you. If you've never come to Christ before, there'll be a prayer on the screen. You can just make those words into your words. Just take a moment and give yourself to him. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, what if you just offered him your body anew? In view of your great mercy, Jesus, in view of what you did with your body for me, I offer my body to you now as a living sacrifice. I offer you my past, my aches and pains, my limitations, my mixed up desires. I offer it all to you. There's nothing about your body that would keep Jesus from you. There's nothing about you that would keep him from you except your rejection of him. And maybe right now you just need to even say, Jesus, there's, there's a part, there's some things you know, Jesus, that happened to my body. And I just need to offer it to you and ask you to begin to, to do a healing work even now. Maybe you need to repent. Jesus, I've been doing stuff with my body and offering it to other things. And I, I need to come back to you right now. You said, my, my body feels broken and weak. Will you bring me strength and renewal? And while I'm in this body of weakness, I offer myself to you until my strength returns. Offer yourself to him. Father, would you take now all your words the scriptures, the truth in your word now. And would you let it bear much good fruit in our lives that we would live in your beautiful, good and true story. And we would embody that to the watching world around us. The living hope found in Jesus who offered his body for us in our place for our sins. We worship now in response to you, in Jesus' name.